At its very core, drug science must remain independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. It's with the support of the drug science community we're able to do this and make the podcast in the first place. If you're able to become a drug science community member and support the show, you too will be supporting the dissemination of evidence-based drug policies. Without you, none of this would be possible. For anybody interested, there's a link in the show notes. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. Hello everybody and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, Joe Neal and Hannah Thurger. Today we have a fantastic guest, everybody, and he is coming from the other side of the world, from all the way from Auckland in New Zealand. So we're honoured today to have Dr. Suresh Mutha Kumara Swami here with us this morning. And I had to practice that a few times, folks, I can tell you. Suresh is an associate professor in the School of Pharmacy in Auckland, and he leads the Neuropsychopharmacology Research Group there. And that's kind of very dear to my own heart because I think neither of us are pharmacists and we both sit in a school of pharmacy. But I could be wrong about the pharmacy. We'll find, we will find it right. (laughs) And that's always been, I always felt quite an interesting position actually to be, to be sitting in a school of pharmacy, not being a pharmacist. But Suresh, everybody, is an absolutely a rising star in the psychedelics field. And he has published well over 100 papers. Uh, and he is still pretty young. PhD in psychology, uh, there you go, about not being a pharmacist at the University of Auckland. And then he came to the UK and spent nine years here in the UK. He worked at Cardiff in the Brain Research Imaging Centre as a postdoc. And he also worked with the Imperial Psychedelics Research Centre group, led, of course, by our very own David Nutt. He worked with Chris Timmerman, Robin Carhart-Harris. So we I'm sure we'll be hearing a little bit about his experience there. So his expertise is in methodologies for imaging. And we heard a lot about this from Prof Mittal Meta. So this, this should follow on nicely. And while at Imperial, he worked on imaging studies with DMT and ketamine, exploring functional connectivity in the psychedelic state, which is, is very hard to do. So he has used transcranial magnetic stimulation as well as ketamine in trials for depression. So very, very warm welcome to you, Suresh, to the Drug Science Podcast. Thanks, Joe. Thanks very much for the kind introduction. So I thought we'd start by talking a little bit about your your background, having been grown up in New Zealand. Yeah, I grew up in pretty, well, at first I'd say, uh, I think you're coming from the other side of the world is how in New Zealand we like to think of it. But <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> but uh, no, I grew up in small town, it's relatively small town New Zealand, a place called Hamilton, uh, then until I was 18, then I went to university in Auckland, and Auckland was a good place to do my studies, but actually there was no psychopharmacology, which was what I was interested in doing. So I sort of did my PhD in kind of normal neuroscience and then it was time to leave and go to the UK where there were other opportunities and it was during my postdoc years I got into psychopharmacology which is or neuropsychopharmacology really that marriage between you know psychopharmacology and imaging techniques so but then home called so I had to go home (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Home always calls, I think, which is absolutely lovely. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about your work with, with David Nutt and that Imperial team? Yeah, I mean, it actually, that work started quite a bit before the psychedelics stuff, actually. It was really, I started working with David on the on his GABA program and the GABA research looking at drugs like anti-epileptics like tiagabine and some of the um, anxiolytics and sleep medicines like zolpidem and those kind of things. And we were doing imaging of those those compounds. And then Robin started to do the first psilocybin study at Cardiff. And uh, he was actually doing the fMRI study. And I was kind of curiously watching going, well, is this going to work? This looks pretty ambitious because, you know, it had never been done before. And I just sort of watched from the sidelines. And they managed to pull it off. And it was quite interesting. And they showed that sort of curious result that the activity seemed to decrease in certain areas of the brain, which was not what we'd anticipate or what anyone had really anticipated. And so well, then I sort of had a conversation with David and Robin. Well, that's kind of interesting. 
why don't we try and do the same study with magnetoencephalography, which was my area of expertise. And that's how I sort of got into this, was we could do that same fMRI type studies with the MEG as a sort of confirmatory um, collaborative technology. So we did that with psilocybin, and then we did studies with LSD, and then I did my own ketamine studies, and it's just spiraled from there, really. Brilliant. Can you tell, just for our listeners, a little bit about what MEG is? Yeah, so most, I guess many people will be familiar with EEG, which is, you know, when you stick electrodes on the head and you can record the electric currents associated with sensory and thought processes, etc. So MEG is the magnetic equivalent of uh, EEG. So every electric current has an associated magnetic field, and you can put these little detectors on the outside of the scalp so you don't have to put electrodes on, and you can detect those tiny little magnetic fields with an EEG, and it's quite fiddly, it's quite, in some respects, it's more sensitive than EEG. In other res- respects, it's less sensitive, depending on what you want to measure. But it was quite a useful technology to um, deploy into those studies. So that's what EEG is. Excellent. Now, that would be very, very helpful for our, our listeners. So what were the kind of the, the main findings, I suppose, that, that drove your subsequent research? Yeah, so I guess... It was interesting that doing the first psilocybin MEG studies was kind of jaw-dropping. I remember having my jaw drop when we first looked at the data that came out um, because the uh, spectra was just – normally the EEG kind of oscillates around a bit, you know, and, sh- and then after we'd injected people with psilocybin, the whole spectrum just kind of flatlined out. And it was – I'd been recording EEG and MEG for, I don't know, like, maybe almost 10 years at that point. <laughs> I was a bit younger then, but and I'd never seen anything like it, just this complete flattening of the spectrum. So it was just, and it was really powerful. You could see it in individual subjects after the injections, this massive change in brain activity. So that was just kind of fascinating that you have such powerful changes and it hadn't been described before. So it was just really interesting to kind of observe that and then try to figure out how that was associated with cognition and people's psychometric experiences, which is what we tried to pull out in some of those early papers. Yeah, it's just such a fascinating area of research, isn't it? So then yeah. I guess you, you go back to New Zealand. And did you did you start working on psychedelics in New Zealand straight away? Uh, no, I didn't because I, I'd already been working in with ketamine in, in the UK. So I'd already been doing my own. I did one of the early MEG studies of ketamine. And, and you know, going back to a new country, no one had ever done a psychist, well, you know, as a sort of growing researcher, but actually pretty new on the block, really, in terms of like getting things like funding and a lab together. The thought of going back and going straight and say, hey, I want to give people LSD and like do all these studies. It was, it was just wasn't realistic to think that that would get funded. So a much more strategic way was to um, go via ketamine because ketamine was easily accessible. It already had anesthetic uses. We could run clinical trials and depression. So we did a number of trials in ketamine first, and that was kind of I guess you could say rather humorously that ketamine was my dra- gateway drug when I got back to New Zealand <laughs> <laughs> because um, that allowed me to build up my lab group, build up the kind of personnel and do some interesting studies. And then after we'd done a, so uh, we did clinical trial and ketamine with treatment resist depression patients with imaging and we did transcranial magnetic stimulation. When that was kind of wrapped up with it, well, maybe, you know, the lab's big enough and we can kind of, start to think about doing some psychedelic studies and that's what we've been doing more recently. But Suresh, ketamine is scheduled, in the UK it's Schedule 2, which means we have research exemption, but psychedelics are in Schedule 1. So I guess that was a difficulty for doing this kind of research for you with all the permissions required? Legally, it's not a major obstacle, actually. It's more about just concern. And the inability to fund the research, right? So there's nothing in law that, and we might go into this when we talk about our microdosing studies, which are quite unique. Yes, yeah. But there's actually, in the New Zealand legal system, there's not actually much of a distinction between what we would call them class A substance, LSD, and like ketamine, which is class C. Actually, you can, in New Zealand, the legal system is such that you can actually prescribe, if you get permission, a class A substance to somebody. You, you have to get special permission to do it. But you can actually prescribe it for medical reasons, and there's already you can give prescribed four weeks of legal supply. It's just no one does it, but it's actually written into our 1975 Misuse of Drugs Act. So actually, we don't have huge restrictions legally on what we can do with Schedule One substances. We have quite a lot of flexibility actually under our current Misuse of Drugs Act. 
So that's good. That makes it much easier. So does anyone prescribe LSD or another psychedelic in New Zealand? No, but we do that for our clinical trials. But you could do it for therapeutic purposes. You'd have to get a ministerial consent to do it. Uh, so you'd have to you know, provide justification. And no one's actually pr- tried before, to be honest, because we're quite small. And when I put our first LSD uh, trial through, this was probably the first time the route had been... Uh, <laughs> Had been attempted actually because it was in the rules, but no one had ever no one had ever attempted it before. And so when I put this front to the ethics committee, they were like, "We're not sure if this is legal." And then we had to get lawyers to ba- I had to get a pharmacy lawyer to basically interpret all the regulations and and explain to them why it was legal. And then they had their own, and there was a bit of a half a year back and forth between the the lawyers to basically to establish that what was actually written in plain language that we were correct and that we could do that. But there was some institutional reluctance, I guess. But now that reluctance has kind of been swept aside, I would say, now that the precedent has been made. So at least for clinical trials, at least, it's reasonably easy to get all that stuff That's going. That's great news. And how is the funding situation in New Zealand? The funding situation is very different to the UK. It's much more limited. We have much less money to do stuff. And this is also sort of slightly dictated the way my research has gone in New Zealand, is that we have to be much more applied in the way we think about things. We can't just do like abstract, you know, experimental medicine type stuff and just out of scientific curiosity or even like, you know, scientific usefulness. And really to get our funding here, we really have to be thinking about clinical applications. Um, So we have to be, we can tack on scientifically interesting things, but we have to be very clinically oriented about the kind of research that will realistically get funded because, it's a small funding pot and there's a lot of really great researchers and you don't go into a mental health pool. You go into a like big pool with like really great scientists doing like, you know, cardiac research and all sorts of really important health research. So you have to you know, be able to compete with that in terms of societal impact. So, you know, you have to be very pragmatic. And I see that Australia has guaranteed 15, 15 million, is it, for psychedelic research? Yeah, those trials are all up and running. They're all about, that was a couple of years ago that they did that. And that was kind of like a pump priming, priming approach, I think, where they were just like, the way they earmark specific amounts of money. But we haven't had that in New Zealand. So we've just been in the open research pools and we've done okay. You know, we've got, yeah, yeah we've been very grateful to our funders. Yeah, you've done very, very well. We could do with a big pot like that in the UK, you know, to pump prime more psychedelic research. Yeah, so I mean, I got two grants from the Health Research Council in New Zealand to do LSD clinical trials, but that was an open competition with all the other great research out there. So it was, uh... well, well done you, because that is <laughs> that is so hard. So Hannah and I, we and our listeners will be are really interested in your the LSD microdosing trial. So mm. do tell us all about that, sort of where it came from, and so it's great design. Yeah, so I guess you know there had been a few microdosing studies and. But what they've done is basically give small LSD doses in the laboratory to participants. You know, you give them 10, 20 micrograms of LSD and you do some kind of physiology measurements and maybe some psychological tasks and you send them on their way. And not much really happens in those studies, to be honest, you know. And that was an attempt, obviously, people are probably might be familiar with microdosing. There's a lot of claims that people are microdosing in the community say, is that, you know, that does all these things. And so there was a bit of a mismatch between what, has been reported in the user community and then what sort of had been reported so far in the scientific literature. And, you know, to me, the like big thing was that, well, you know, like pretty boring in the lab. <laughs> you sit there and, you know, you sit there given some LSD or whatever and you sit there for six or eight hours and there's no environmental stimulation. You're not living your life. But that's actually what microdoses are doing, right? They're out there getting environmental stimulation while they take a microdose and it's, you know, so there's some setting involved, right? And, and they're doing their own activities or, and using to enhance those experiences. But you can't do that in a laboratory. So our microdosing study, what I guess the unique thing about it was that we had controlled substances. So we got pharmaceutically manufactured LSD, not people, not one of these studies where people are sort of self-sourcing their own stuff where you don't really know the provenance of it. There's no control. You know, it's a bit where so we had, might manufacture LSD, but we were allowed to then prescribe that LSD for people to take home and take the doses at home. And so they went on to a six-week protocol where they would microdose every third day. 
and we had 40 uh, in the active group and 40 in the placebo group and they completed a six-week microdosing protocol and they were completing surveys all the time they're reporting on their daily existence and it's kind of interesting so we actually managed to run a kind of proper community microdosing trial but compared to some of the other trial results, quite a lot of the results we've seen, I saw a compilation of, of all results from many, many trials by David Arizzo. And, and really, after the statistical analysis, nothing really stood up to the, the scrutiny, none of the outcome measures. But actually, in your trial, you did see some significant benefits in people. Yeah, people were, you know, statistically robust uh, increases in people's reports of, I have to remember, like their feelings of wellness and creativity and energy. So that was all good. On the flip side, there were a few participants that actually experienced enhanced anxiety and we actually had to withdraw them from the trial. So it's not just that it's doing good things. You can actually get a subset of participants who get like experienced treatment-related anxiety, even at these very small doses, which actually, I think, speaks to the fact that it's actually doing something, right? You can get things going both ways. It's not just like a sort of homeopathic dose, 10 micrograms. So there was that. And actually, the most robust finding is currently under review, and it's out there as a, a preprint. But actually, what we're really interesting finding came out. We had all the people wearing um, sleep and activity trackers. And what we found was that actually the night after microdosing, people slept an extra 24 minutes every night. Wow. So not the night of the microdose, the day after, it was like they kind of got more, their brain got more tired and on the next day they had to sleep an extra 24 minutes and that was really big, robust finding and that's a really interesting finding as well because it's an objective marker, right? It's not a placebo response when you need to sleep for an extra and 24 minutes is like a big chunk of extra sleep. So that's not a placebo response unless you can placebo sleep. <laughs> um, so, it's an, so it's an objective behavioral measure. Yeah. The intervention has made a behavioral change in participants. So that was kind of interesting, exciting, and completely unexpected. I mean, that's, that's a fantastic finding, you know, for people who are struggling with sleep. Maybe get a better quality of sleep. I don't know. That's very hard to measure. Well, yeah. I would be very tentative to say to use it for a sleeping intervention because, you know, there's a lot of extra things happening. I think it's more, I don't think it's saying that LSD microdosis would be a sleep intervention, more that it's probably taxing the brain the day before and like people are having to think hard or the brain's having to do extra work essentially the day before of that microdose. And it's really um, being pushed a little bit and that might be therapeutically useful or might not be, but it's getting extra work done that it needs to recover from. And there's plenty of other EG studies as well from like Harriet DeWitt's lab showing actually that LSD microdoses do change the EG as well. So there is a converging picture, I think, that actually these doses do get into the brain. They do stuff, has behavioral and subjective consequences. And that actually, when I last heard David Arizzo talk about this and show the data, had they done some PET imaging studies and there clearly was receptor occupancy of the 2A receptor, there's clearly, you know, people are clearly get a pharmacological effect. As you said about the the people who had anxiety, and that that's particularly interesting, Hannah, I think we thought that. Mm. Yeah, I'm mean, wondering if you know any reasons why some people are more sensitive or there's anything that can, might, might indicate that some people might have more likelihood of experiencing anxiety. Yeah, we do have some indications. I'm not going to say uh, on the podcast <laughs> yet because that is, it's currently in the computer being written up and, and being generated, but we have some pretty good clues as to what's going on there and why particular people suffer from anxiety. But one of the things we absolutely learned during that trial, we did what everything out, everyone does in these trials, right, was that we did started off using fixed doses, just, just give everyone 10 micrograms and – Send them away. But actually, that's not what microdoses do, right? They start low and they build up their dose to find their sweet spot and they, they titrate up their dose. In our current clinical trial with depressed patients, that's what we're doing. And we had to adopt that in a few patients in the, in the phase one trial as well, actually. Go start low and build them up to that kind of sweet spot dose because people are differentially sensitive. And so... Just giving fixed doses, because you get some people on a fixed dose of 10 micrograms, they can't feel a thing. 
and other people, it's overwhelming. And that's not ideal if you're out in the world, right? Um, trying to function. Some people are like, well, this is just like nothing. And other people are like, oh, I can't handle my day on 10 micrograms. So there needs to be individualization probably of the dosing. And how easy is it, is it to build that into a protocol? Because we had to do that within our medical cannabis study for long COVID. And sometimes trying to have this kind of openness with a dosing schedule can be a bit difficult if in the real world, you need to have this individualization of the treatment. In terms of how you generate the titration yeah. or, the blind, or the blinding? Or... or building it more than just the protocol design, was it accepted by the ethics committee? Yeah, so we have also the equivalent of MHRA, our version of them, also do trial protocol reviews. We there was no problem getting it through those places. We just kind of rationalized it. We showed the data that we'd collected and it's like, this is what we think would be lead to better outcomes and a better scientific design. And they didn't seem to think it was particularly controversial to do that. What we're trying to work on now is in sort of the optimal titration schedule. Like, you know, we don't know the best way to do it yet. We're working on that at the moment in our current trial. So, And something else me and Joe spotted, I'm sure you're asked this all the time, the original study was all males. So this upcoming study, will it include females as well? So yes, this is an open-label trial in depressed patients, and there will be a mixture of males and females, and there will be a minimum 25% Indigenous representation in the sample. And we are aware of the that because we actually do a lot of menstrual cycle studies and we are starting to plan a females only study that will be customized for microdosing and that is oh. on the on the whiteboard at the moment literally okay fascinating we're delighted to so, hear that <laughs> aren't we hannah yeah rather than studying women whose ovulatory cycles have been suppressed to make them like men we're going to be studying women as women if that makes sense so that was going to be my question. So what, women won't, will not be on any contraception at all? No. Well, that's what we've got to get past the ethics committee <laughs> and the safety reviews. But otherwise, you know, because obviously it's the, the ter- fear of teratinogenesis, but otherwise you're never going to study women and they'll never have drugs available for them, right? So you have to, like, find a way around this. And we think there are ways to deal with that. So but yeah, that's on the whiteboard. And we will be fixing that equity gap. Oh, well, we'll be, well, me and Joe will be keeping an eye out for it for sure. Well, it's going to take a few years, mind you. <laughs> we, will work, we will work on it. Yeah. It is a brave thing to do. So, in sort of in that context, you have done some work on the menstrual cycle and neuroplasticity. Can you tell us a little bit about it? That was primarily my postdoc, who's now a pretty independent research fellow, actually, Rachel Sumner, um, who, who did that for a PhD. And yeah, we were looking at how. The menstrual cycle affects plasticity markers. And even just the raw EEG, you know, gets affected by the menstrual cycle. And I forget the exact pattern of the results, but I think it's in the luteal phase, there's less plasticity, whereas in the follicular phase, it's more plastic. So, which means that, you know, it's very complicated, but it's amazing how strong these neurosteroidal effects are on brain activity. And yeah, it's a really fascinating area where that kind of endocrine neural interface. Oh, it is such a fascinating area, Suresh. And it's something as women that we feel and we know, but to have, you know, some scientific validity, I think. How, what do you think, Hannah? Completely. I was saying earlier, I feel like some, you know, some people are very in tune with their cycle, some people not so in tune. Um, but having some rationale can be really helpful, I think, for people who do want to understand maybe why their mood or their experiences might fluctuate throughout the cycle. And again, I think understanding how contraception might play into that. And then again, people who microdose or also take doses at more of a macrodose level, understanding how that might be impacted where you are in the cycle. This is something that's being discussed a little bit more with in terms of harm reduction. We know that people are impacted when they take drugs at different time points, or at least um, anecdotally anyway. So yeah. Yeah, we'd certainly want to study that with microdosing as cycle effects. Um, and Ra- I mean, Rachel is actually doing a really interesting non-psychedelic study. She's studying a cohort of patients with catamenial epilepsy, this is where the epileptic seizures increase mostly during the luteal phase. You get this neurosteroid withdrawal 
Um, in, in the luteal phase, these women who are heavy epilepsy get seizure exacerbation. So she's studying the kind of neural mechanisms of that. So that's independent psychedelics. Very interesting um, kind of excitation inhibition balances in the brain. So obviously most women aren't going to get seizures, but these women who have epilepsy get this exacerbation. It's very hard to treat and can be quite debilitating. Wow. And so just remind us when estrogen is high, in which of those phases? Yeah, so estrogen is high earlier and then progesterone rises late in the luteal phase. So that's kind of the interesting sort of part. And then it kind of drops off a cliff once you hit into menses. Yeah, and we did a study in pregnant women monitoring estrogen and progesterone, gonadal steroids and, and monitoring cognitive function. And just so interesting to see those huge, you know, or the very steady rise in estrogen and progesterone all the way through pregnant, pregnancy. And then, as you say, they fall off a cliff you know, immediately postpartum and, and following women for a year and looking at their cognitive function. And it does take quite a long time to kind of completely normalize, go back to pre-pregnancy levels. So the impact of gonadal steroids. And, and were you tracking mood as well? In that? Yes, yes, yes. And sleep. And, you know, because obviously all those factors have a huge impact on, on cognitive function. Yeah, and trying to um, sort of rule out other other factors. It's really, it was a really interesting study, actually. Yeah, and these studies can be very difficult to do, though, during the menstrual because of the menstrual cycle tracking. Because, like, you read the book and it's like, ah, oh, twenty eight day cycle, and that's just not the case at all. When you start on an individual patient basis, it's just like, ah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's um, right. So it's not me, it's Rachel tearing her hair out. It's uh, trying to, you know, hit people at the right phases. And, you know, so, and we, oh, she does like a lot of ovulation testing and blood testing to make sure she's always hitting the right phases. But it's quite an operation to actually do it. It's not trivial. No, so difficult. And that was the other study, the menstrual cycle and cognition. Yes, having to do bloods and, and track it. Yeah, because clearly people didn't really know exactly where they were on the cycle. And you really need to, to do the bloods. It's such great work, though. And of course, for somebody in my stage of life, it's very interesting thinking about the menopause and the impact of HRT then on plasticity. Yeah, there's, so there's so many uh, you know interesting things, and I think these things have to be dealt with one at a time. So, like, you know, you kind of have to deal with each cohort as a separate thing, not kind of smush them all together as if it's all just one biological. You know, that we're all one species, you know, like each kind of phenomenology needs to be dealt with separately and properly addressed. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And it's really important your your just to go back to your microdosing study, the titration of the doses and that everybody responds differently because that's something in talking to people I find out. Yeah, and we think that'll be really important when, we, when we're now running the depression trial is to make sure that every patient is at the kind of at the right dose to sort of maximize the hypothesized therapeutic effect that we should be trying to get them at right at the, sort of right on the dose and and we discovered in the phase one trial it doesn't take many micrograms to tip someone over the edge or pull them back it can be quite a subtle difference in dose so it has to be done quite carefully and we're now just working out at the moment in this trial we're seeing the data come in because it's open label about where that titration range and that therapeutic dose is going to actually sit. So, but we'll know more and probably by the end of the year, actually what that therapeutic range is so that we can de then deploy it into a bigger RCT. Brilliant stuff. Absolutely great. Yeah. And for our listeners, we'll be putting all this work into the show notes, this LSD microdosing trial. And the, the other thing, Suresh, that you've been writing about and working on is kind of the limitations of some of the psychedelic trials to date. And I think it's very important for us all to be well aware of, of the some of the issues with running these trials. Yeah, yeah. So it's quite, it's a little kind of bugbear. Right? It's funny to me though, right? Because often I talk about microdosing, you know, because that's the studies we do. And because so, ah, it's probably all just placebo effect. So the psychedelics research, right? It's all placebo signal. Well, hang on, like, <laughs> you're giving these massive doses to people that could all just be placebo effect, right? Like, because people are immediately unblinded to the intervention that they've received, which, so it's, it's a big problem because, you know, after you've seen placebo effects in trials, when you've given a patient 
so, like we had in our ketamine trials, for example, we had people who were given remifentanil, which should have no antidepressant effect. We had people with treatment resistance to depression go into remission after receiving this, you know, remifentanil. And you're just like, well, like you can get massive, massive placebo effects in individual participants for or placebo effect or at least some kind of response. You know, maybe it was naturally remitting, but these are depressed patient, treatment resistant patients who had them for a long time so so it makes you kind of concerned when you see that well this is this is a big potential effect and we don't know how how much of that is contributing to the effect size that we're seeing in some of these psychedelic clinical trials and we, we should try to to try to solve it and that's one of the reasons like like microdosing because i reckon we can probably blind microdosing trials reasonably well even if we get to because like we can probably like use an active placebo and we've got active placebos in our RCT that will come up and we can probably do a reasonable job of fooling the participants about whether they've had LSD versus some other stimulant. Whereas, uh, so I think we can probably blind those trials reasonably successfully. I think it'll be actually a lot harder to to blind the macrodosing trials. So actually I think we'll probably have more rigorous data at the end where some of these trials might have, these issues might've been addressed. And I think we do need to, it is incumbent on us to try to solve those problems because I think we need to be sure that our interventions, if we are going to deploy these into clinical practice, we need to be sure that they actually are, you know, genuinely interventions because otherwise we're exposing patients to things that maybe they shouldn't be exposed to. And then if we then allow, this is my next bugbear, is if we then allow, where does Pandora's box shut? right in terms of like if we allow one thing to get through on lower quality not quite gold standard events what else do we let through the kind of regulatory system to be okay and what is the standard of evidence we need to get drugs or other therapies treatments approved so i so i worry about the pandora's box thing as well yeah and of course in australia psychedelics have been legalized psilocybin and mdma yeah yeah so it's a little more precise than that. It's that it's, yeah. So a psychiatrist can prescribe psilocybin for treatment resistant depression or MDMA for post traumatic stress disorder. So, it, so there is a linking. So it's not generally things. And there's a lot of traps, and it's a bit uncertain. I was actually on the steering committee that helped the college write the guidelines for how psychiatrists would manage certain parts of it. So I'm reasonably familiar with a lot of the issues. And there's quite a lot of issues about how it will roll out because it's not clear what the training, the accreditation should be and like what the protocols should necessarily be. And then there's going to be pricing and equity issues in terms of access. So, you know, it's a great big experiment because the TGA, the Australian Good Therapeutic Goods, things made this decision, okay, you can do this prescription, but then like none of the infrastructure was in place to actually support it happening. And so... I think that the college and other places have been bolting on guidelines in order to try to make this happen. And there's been a lot of patient inquiries. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. And there was also another issue is, is I'm not aware that there was funding wasn't put aside by the government to actually create a registry for the, all the data to be captured. And that's a big issue because, you know, there won't be an unbiased way to evaluate the success of the program or the programs because there's no compulsory re- data registry. To, if you're going to if you're going to treat a patient, you know there's not going to be any objective way of knowing how many had a really bad or a really good outcome because you wouldn't even know if there's some sort of sampling bias. So it's not a clean way of not a clean implementation. So yeah, but it is what it is, and we'll see what happens. Yeah, and it is very very exciting for patients and clinicians, and I guess the rest of the world will be watching. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be very interesting to see how it rolls out. <laughs> kind of, we're just watching from across the ditch, but you know that it creates impacts in New Zealand because as Australian patients start to get that kind, those kind of treatments, patients in New Zealand will just look across the ditch and go, "Well, why can't we get this treatment? Can we just fly? Can I just fly to Australia and get the treatment?" And that's really bad when you have like people seeking out healthcare in the neighbouring country. But, you know, so that's going to create. A, won't happen immediately, but it will happen in New Zealand that patients will probably start to do that and questions will be asked. So it's probably going to impact New Zealand's healthcare, psychiatric healthcare as well, due to our proximity. And how likely is it even that New Zealand might follow? There's this kind of loophole in the law where you can prescribe 
um, schedule schedule one drugs. Do you think anyone's gonna gonna try and bite the bullet and just do it? Yeah, there's a few people out there that are eyeing up the bullet at the moment. I would say uh, <laughs> they're looking at it, and the the regulatory system it can be done, but it's not simple to navigate. So it can definitely. We would see, but I guess we would, me and some of our colleagues, we would prefer that it, there was a more organized way that it happened, that it was done under a kind of semi sort of a model where we were actually, if people were to do this, that there was actually like data capture and that we could actually objectively measure what the outcomes and, you know, in terms of like behavioral outcomes and like how well that it helped people return to work or come off like social supports and all these kind of things. And we at Action New Zealand has a big data, integrated data infrastructure where we can actually, you could actually get all this data out of various systems. So it would be better if it was kind of actually government sort of funded and run through rather than just people trying it because then we could actually evaluate how well it was working properly and that would be much preferable. That's something we've been advocating for at Drug Science as a blog on our website discussing the need for real world evidence with Australia. And obviously we do that with Project 21, Medical Cannabis Registry, looking at both efficacy and safety. You know, it's this unique position where you're able to collect safety data in the real world. So that's hope Australia does that. And in whichever countries might follow, they're able to implicate it as well. We can hope anyway, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the other issues is the cost. I think for us, when this does become a medicine, we're, we're committed, certainly, you know, at drug science and, and people we work with, to enabling patient access on our healthcare system so that it isn't a private only medicine. That would be, that would be terrible. I mean, that's how it's rolling out in Australia at the moment, right? And it's going to cost about $25,000, which I'd I haven't checked the exchange rate lately. That's probably like twelve and a half thousand pounds per patient for you know for a treatment program. And that's just too expensive, right? But then a lot of that is to do with like the protocol and what is an acceptable amount of care before and after, and who who is credentialed to provide that care. And so a lot of that hasn't really been fleshed out that carefully. Uh, but those make massive differences, right? Whether it's a psychiatrist or a psychotherapist makes a massive difference on cost as to um, how much that treatment protocol will cost. And then, But then what are the minimum safety standards? So there's all these issues that have manifold implications. That Australia will be working on for us. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> uh, maybe New Zealand. It sounds like a very, maybe a very appropriate country but to be doing this in, but I guess we wait and see. I just wanted to ask you about sort of the ethics and the appropriation of uh, plant medicines that have been used by indigenous cultures for thousands of years, kind of by the West as, as a medicine. And how do we, how do we sort of give back and, and have appropriate reciprocity? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Like, I'm not an expert in this in research. And what I would say is that's one of the reasons it's been very comfortable for me to work with LSD as a drug because we yeah. have to worry about cultural appropriation <laughs> and uh, or using anything like that. So it's very clean for me like that and I don't have to deal with those issues. But for psilocybin, it is an issue because, for example, in New Zealand, we have, an, we have psilocybin, we have endemic and native species of psilocybin just growing all over the place and We also actually have something called the Treaty of Waitangi, which actually grants Maori rights over indigenous flora and fauna, and they actually have the right to essentially use those resources for their good. So it's actually a little bit controversial that psilocybin could even be a controlled substance in New Zealand because actually that violates the Treaty of Waitangi in some respects because actually it's it's an indigenous, well, it's not a flora, it's an indigenous fungi, right? So that is an issue. But it's kind of interesting because Maori didn't appear to use the indigenous mushrooms from what we've been able to ascertain. They didn't use the indigenous sort of side of mushrooms. And there's no really evidence for that. Uh, even oh, around. that's interesting. That's very interesting. They didn't use them. Yeah, well, we, it's kind of interesting because, well, but then what happened during colonial times is, I think it was 1906 or 1908, there was something called the Tohunga Suppression Act, where actually the um, British colonialists um, banned Maori, Maori health, indigenous health practices. So the Tohunga, the healers, were actually suppressed from their practice. So maybe they did know something back then, but their knowledge got kind of suppressed out. We, we don't know. 
But it's very unusual that you had this strikingly psychoactive mushrooms and these people that knew all about everything on their land but didn't seem to have a connection with this particular thing, which most other cultures had. So that seems to me is quite unusual, but we don't really know. And it's a fascinating, fascinating piece of ethnography, though. Mm-hmm. And do you think the treaty would be respected? What would happen if a psilocybin-based medicine were to be authorised and it were to come into New Zealand? How would that sit with the treaty? Well, you know, if it's if being imported, then that's not an issue. But if it's being if it's being naturally grown, if it's being ma- you know if it's being manufactured into, into a product in New Zealand, that's when you have treaty rights issues and. There's a massive, I'm not a legal scholar, but there's a massive legal claims process, uh, something called the Waitangi Tribunal, which uh, sort of, and there's been rulings from the courts about exploitation of intellectual property in New Zealand. So actually, New Zealand is probably one of the more, uh, we're not brilliant, but we're one of the more kind of progressive cultures in how we've tried to deal with and and create reciprocity for some of that indigenous exploitation that happened during colonial times. It's not perfect, but... it's definitely better than other places. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's encouraging to hear. It is, yes, it's very, very good news. Very, yeah, very encouraging. And maybe a model for for other people to use in other places. I see there is a psilocybin whole mushroom study planned for methamphetamine dependence in Maori people in Taranga. I don't think I've pronounced that right, but the University of Waikato. Yeah, they're, they're planning that study. I guess the interesting thing about, and I've been kind of liaising with them a little bit on that study, the interesting thing about that study is the plan, though, is to actually give the indigenous mushroom to the patients and actually give it on the marae, so not in a clinical research centre, but in the marae is the kind of the Maori kind of spiritual houses and the kind of communal buildings. So to actually give them on site so that, you know, that can build up that kind of connection with, ancestry and the land, whenua, we call it, and with the tupuna, their ancestors, so trying to create a kind of spiritual experience. And that was the plan was to, was to do that first in healthy volunteers and get sort of safety parameters before heading into clinical population. It'll take a while to get to get this all going, but that's the idea is to give it in a more naturalistic setting that might, you know, have more beneficial effects. Because let's face it, like sitting in a lab is pretty boring. And, and also it might be a move on from, you know, that kind of like, sitting in a little room with blindfolds on, which is one way of psychedelics can be given, but it's by no means like what actually has happened in indigenous societies, right, for a long time. So it'll be heading more towards that frame, but under a controlled setting as well, you know, so there will still be monitoring. That seems to be a really, really interesting study, very important. So we'll be keeping our eyes on that, won't we, Hannah? Yeah, for sure. So I'm aware that we're kind of running out of time. Hannah, is there anything else we should talk about? Suresh, is there anything you'd like to to tell the listeners? Uh, no, I think we've touched on most of the kind of things that I do. Not that interesting. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's been a yeah good conversation. I think update about what's happening in psychopharmacology at the bottom side of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, we have lots, to, get, <laughs> lots to, to be seeing how it progresses. Really, really excited to see all the upcoming work on menstrual cycle, the microdosing in depression, and also the, the upcoming uh, full mushroom, mushroom study as well. So, yeah, very, very exciting, Joe. It's, it's been fantastic, Suresh. Yes, thank you so much for joining us today. And I think it's very heartening for, for all the people out there who are microdosing you know, that there is a pharmacological effect and there are benefits in the trials, you know, where where you've had a naturalistic setting and, and a trial that's been properly and carefully blinded. So we will put that trial in the show notes so everybody can read that. It makes fantastic reading. And your other paper about the challenges ahead for bringing psychedelic drugs in as, as medicines. And we will keep our listeners updated and hopefully Suresh you will come back maybe in a while and keep us updated as to your progress because it's it's very very exciting what's happening uh, with you happy to takes a while to get these things done though (laughs) (laughs) oh I know oh I know and we're so lucky Suresh that we have people like you and all the guys Imperial Centre and 
kings and, and, you know, all over the world doing all this work because it takes a long time and it takes an awful lot of work to get these trials going. It certainly does. <laughs> Makes my hair go grey as well. <laughs> <laughs> well worth it, though, and we're following it all closely. Cool. So thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you.